you know, let's start with just sort of cloud in general. So actually, maybe we should start a little bit further back. You know, VMware, I think people originally kind of associate you with virtualization, mm -hmm. uh, pioneer there. Uh, but you've gone way beyond that. Um, maybe position for us a little bit what you do, how you're thinking about, um, you know, your technology in, in sure. the future that it... Yeah. I should even start by saying um, this is my first time to attend the Gov20 Summit. I've just been, uh, I've been really inspired by all the ideas that people have, um, if they can use technology to make education or government more collaborative. And uh, I'm a technology guy, so these, these problems that can be solved with technology is at the core of what we've tried to do. Um, so we started VMware actually about 12 years ago out of Stanford, and um, we were trying to bring back an old idea from the 60s and 70s. In fact, the uh, the original project name was Disco, because we wanted to bring this idea back. Um, and the idea was to leverage virtualization in new ways. Um, it's, you know, fast forward 12 years, it's really proven to be um, kind of a Swiss army knife of technology. It's used for data center optimization, for delivering uh, desktops in new ways, for writing applications in new ways. And, and as you mentioned, it's really proving to be a key ingredient for this cloud computing movement. And so we're really finding us, ourselves in the middle of this uh, great set of changes that are going on as people try to understand what cloud computing is and try and find the, uh, find the most effective way of moving towards it. Yeah, in a lot of ways, uh, my thinking on cloud uh, is shaped by a wonderful comment that Clay Shirky made at my first uh, P2P conference uh, way back in 2001. We did a conference on really the idea of the Internet operating system back then. And he opened with this line. He said, Thomas Watson of IBM uh, once predicted that there would be only a need for five computers in the world. We now know that he was wrong. And everybody was thinking of the you know, hundreds of millions or billions of, of PCs. And then Clay delivered this devastating punchline. <laughs> we now know that he overstated the number by four. <laughs> and we are really moving to the world uh, where what we think of as a computer is really just a device attached to the real computer. Uh, we are trying to think through uh, what the operating system of that computer looks like. And virtualization is certainly one element of that, but it's more than that. And, mm -hmm. you know, as, as we've talked, uh, you know, I, I think you guys are thinking very hard about what does it mean when all the co computers in the world are connected, when applications can move around, uh, when applications are not strictly living on a single device. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I really enjoy that piece and talking about it. Um, the idea is certainly uh, a very disruptive technology, as we've been talking about. It's a way of thinking about computing where you have um, a lot of the buzzwords, you know, a lot more elastic capabilities, ubiquitous access from whatever device you have. And a lot of these are ideas that have been around for a while just because of internet computing and, and classic client server computing. But what's really disruptive is the notion that it can change the cost model for, for companies and governments. Um, it can really change it in a dramatic way, which lets them survive today, but it also lets them really experiment and do new sorts of applications because of this vast set of resources that they can tap. So also, though, there's kind of an interesting idea, too, that uh, as applications live on the network, you can actually build various kinds of composite applications. I know you did something with Salesforce. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing there? Yeah, um, so some of the challenges of cloud computing, uh, you know, there won't be one giant cloud. There'll be a lot of clouds that need to be interoperable in different ways. And it is triggering different ways of writing applications. Um, so we've gotten quite involved in thinking about how do you, how do you really deliver some of these great maybe challenge.gov applications, some of these great interactive sites that are collaborative in a way that really lets you leverage all the different pieces of the cloud. So specifically, we're working with a number of partners, um, Salesforce.com and Google, to define a way to write applications that can run great in the Salesforce.com cloud. Uh, that exact same application should be able to run in Google's cloud and leverage all the great services they have. Or if you're a, a government or a company that doesn't want things in this very public cloud, that exact same collaborative application you could pull into your own cloud data center that you're running locally. And the key thing is to, to really make it portable. Uh, we talk about right now a lot of these um, public clouds are becoming, I'm from California, so we see Hotel California, where you can, you can check in, but you can never leave. And we're really worried about the world where you get really stuck in just one place of running your apps. And that's really a, a big focus of our, of our cloud platform. So cloud interoperability ability, for example, to pick the lowest cost cloud. Uh, what about, uh, do you think at all about uh, issues like um, 
uh, certain kinds of applications need to li live in a particular environment. For example, healthcare uh, requires a different environment because of, of, of uh, HIPAA. Uh, you know, financial applications need their own environment. How do you think about those kinds of things? Sure. So as you said, um, it might be that people, a lot of people talk, to like, talk about commodity markets where you're finding the best or lowest cost cloud, but it's also you might need to find the one that is, um, maybe you have green initiatives. You might want to find the cloud that's powered purely by hydroelectric power. You might want the one that has the best GPS mapping capabilities, so it could be service oriented. But what we're increasingly seeing, particularly in government financial services and, and healthcare, where there is, there can be particular sensitivity around personal data, um, they want something that is much more known where it is. So if you're running a hospital in New Jersey, you might need to use the New Jersey cloud because the requirements are that patient data cannot leave the state. So I think as we go forward, we're gonna see a lot of um, differentiated cloud offerings at the county, state, and certainly at the nation and international boundaries. Um, and, and people are gonna have a real challenge as they choose what type of application makes the most sense and where could it run? What are those requirements either? And, and you don't necessarily want to be doing that manually. You want to basically have the system able to understand your requirements and do the right thing, find you the cheapest uh, exactly. service that meets your requirements. Out. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what's the hardest thing you're working on? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we, that's a really good question. We have about 4,000 engineers, and they would all claim that theirs is hardest, <laughs> probably. Um, but what we actually spend the most time thinking about is that there's this great nirvana out there, the, the cloud, that you know, it solves all problems for zero cost instantly. Um, but the reality is that we all live in a, in a huge set of legacy infrastructure and applications that we, we we're not gonna just throw out. In fact, you can almost always promise kind of an IT nirvana if you just throw out every application you've ever written and throw out all your existing hardware. So actually the hardest thing we spend time on is how to take exactly what you have in place today and incrementally add value to it and have this end goal of running in this, this great automatic cloud world, but incrementally make it easier to run your existing apps, be able to leverage that existing investment you have in hardware along the way. And it's not as, uh, it's not as exciting to talk about in many ways, but it's the, the real challenge people have with here I am today, how in the world do I get to this new world? Yeah, this is a question that may be outside of your um, uh, expertise since you're not necessarily a government focused guy, but uh, I've heard that there's this, what they call in government circles, the color of money problem. That is, uh, money is allocated for capital expenditures, other money is allocated for operating expenditures. Uh, you know, cloud kind of shifts that. And, you know, if you have money to build a data center uh, and you have other money to operate the data center, well, yep. what do you do? I mean, is that one of the barriers to cloud adoption? <laughs> there, there's more. Um I'd say at this point there are more organizational and, and even budget related challenges to moving to the cloud in many ways than there are technology problems. But you're right, a really profound point in many ways is that cloud computing and these new models really shifts what used to be a very big upfront investment towards, a, towards more of a pay by use, more of an electric utility right, right. model. And that does play a lot of, uh, it wreaks havoc on some people's ways of thinking of how they do their spending. Um, but it, it really does change the equation and lets people think about what they're actually using rather than let's spend you know, $100 million on a new data center up front and then amortize it over time. Right. So, um, you know, kind of coming back to um, one of your personal passions, I know you're very interested in education. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the cloud, uh, you, you told me that you connected uh, backstage with Karen Cater and we're very excited about that. And, yeah. Uh, what's VMware's interest in the education market and how do you think the cloud can change education? Yeah, um, so VMware itself is founded out of education. I personally have benefited greatly from the public school system. And um, actually, just today we're launching a new foundation at VMware. And okay. Um, okay. the idea of this foundation isn't just to give money places, that's part of it. But it's actually um, allowing the 4,000 engineers and everyone else at the company to donate five days of their time per year towards something that they're passionate about in the service area. And um, we've been going around talking to all the engineers, and almost all of them care very deeply about the education system. So that's why I was so inspired yesterday by, by Karen and John Seeley Brown and everyone, these ideas on making new computing models that help a personalized education or a richer one. So what we've also been doing is um, trying to leverage virtualization in the cloud to make education um, different. And uh, 
if you don't mind, I could show one just quick sure. slide on an illustrative sure. example of how we're doing this. So I think I have a clicker here. Um, if you don't mind bringing it up. Um, so this is kind of interesting. So I'm from California, and uh, if anyone follows the news, the budget for schools is a disaster in California. I like to hang out with Illinois people because it makes me feel a little less bad. <laughs> but actually, uh, you know, there's huge public funding challenges for school. And so what a, a group in Illinois did that I find very exciting is they looked at all their schools that they have in place around the state. And um, they started by what a number of our earlier guests have talked about. They found um, a way for state-funded broadband to, to get in place. And uh, the Illinois Century Network, as it's called, was funded to connect 9,000 public entities, whether it be K through 12, city offices, or even universities. So they have this great broadband background, backbone in place, but now they have a lot of um, schools, whether they be very small, it might be a broom closet that has a couple of the PCs that are delivering apps to students or that are scheduling school buses. So they created a, a really neat program where they've essentially uh, put three regional uh, Illini clouds, as they call them, in place that are connected to the same broadband fabric. And then they allow a pure opt-in model for existing districts, um, which is very important to them as they don't want to be imposed upon to do something a certain way. So they've actually been allowed to um, steadily move existing infrastructure into these regional centers. And the important thing about this is, as I was talking about earlier, there has to be a very uh, evolutionary way to do this. You can't imagine that you need to go out and train every administrator, every teacher about new applications. And in fact, some of them are very uh, interested in teaching with a particular class of technology. So what I really like about this example is that they were able to create regional um, clouds that basically at no cost to the schools, they could begin to move either existing computing infrastructure in there, or as they go forward with literally zero budget in their plates for technology, they could leverage a, a much more cost-efficient model for the, getting- The budget came from somewhere though. I mean, clearly these clouds were paid for, but this- Yeah, the, yeah, and, and that's the last part of it. Um, what they end up showing up as, um, I think about them as co-op grocery stores a little bit, and I heard another speaker talk about this. Uh, there is some existing funds, maybe it comes from a CAPEX side instead of an OPEX side or a different part of it. But when you have a number of these districts chip in some of their very limited IT funds and pool them together, they've essentially created this co-op cloud, if you will, where each of them have a small uh, monetary stake and they have a controlling stake in it. But by pooling all those resources together, just the classic model in, in all of economics, you can do more and the sum is greater than the individual parts. So now we have, um, we're not there yet, but we have a nice yeah. promise here. Yeah. yeah, and I would imagine that uh, that, that resource will be, become richer over time as more schools contribute. And again, that is that promise of the network, is yep. systems that get better the more people use them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the last thing I just wanted to really mention, the, the key thing, as I said, the hardest problem that we, we live for in many ways, and the hardest problem for almost everybody is how do I get to this, this end state? In this model, it's illustrative of being able to take exactly the applications you have today, the training you have today, and make some progress. But as some of these great ideas uh, presented yesterday come to fruition, they could be offered as the new way of teaching in this Illini cloud, and people can access it on the way. But we haven't had to throw out everything in getting to that end state. So uh, is there a URL for this Illini cloud so that, for example, other states that wanted to do the same thing um, Yeah, actually, more about actually it? it is something that's percolating quite well at a number of states. Um, yeah. Ohio, even California are beginning to look at this concept. Um, I'll tweet the, the links to you a little oh, that'd bit be later fabulous. the group. Yeah, here. because it's, uh, it's a great idea. And it, and it really is you know, one of the key, I think, Gov2.0 concepts, uh, which is that innovations that start in a state or a city uh, can spread. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big federal program. Uh, it really is uh, true that, as Justice Brandeis once said, the, the, the states are the laboratories of democracy. They're also the laboratories of technology. And we're seeing you know, amazing progress as uh, you know, state and local governments uh, move the ball forward. And part of what we need is a culture of sharing so that the best practices uh, that are discovered in one place can spread somewhere else, and I think that's part of what this event is all about. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. That's exactly yeah. what's so rewarding, is how they're pooling thinking, pooling resources from the district up, as yeah. opposed to a top-down mandate. That's fantastic. Well, thanks very much, and uh, I'd I, I love to see what uh, you guys come up with next. Okay, We're, thanks very uh, much. Definitely a company we'll be hearing more from. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.